So opportunistic infections is one of the major hurdles you're going to deal with when you have advanced stage HIV uh, or AIDS patients. So we're going to give that a special focus here. So HIV and AIDS throughout the world is a global problem. Uh, this is a map that shows prevalence. It go anywhere from zero to uh, over 50% of the population. So as you can see, we consider HIV and AIDS a problem in the United States, but only about 0.5 to 1% of the population is in fact infected. So that's really not that much when you compare it to countries like South Africa um, or anywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then also the Southeast Asian countries as well. So. This is a global problem, but uh, this is good to uh, sort of know where we stand uh, and why this is such a big problem in Africa. Now, looking at the United States, uh, most of a lot of this map is just kind of gray areas, meaning that we don't have data. But uh, you can see sort of where the problems are relatively. They're concentrated in the urban centers, of course, and you can see that there's a much bigger uh, HIV AIDS epidemic uh, in the, along the east coast and in the southeast and then along the west coast of California. By race, HIV prevalence is approximately 46% black and 35% white and the other 20% are divided up uh, by uh, Hispanic and Asians and American Indians. Now, how is HIV transmitted? So we all know that HIV is a blood-borne pathogen, so it's spread by sexual contact or IV drug use. Um, in the United States, about half of it is transmitted uh, it, by men who have sex with men. So uh, the other half are going to be IV drug use and heterosexual contact or unknown. Now let's compare this to worldwide transmission. Worldwide, it's actually 73% of transmission is through heterosexual intercourse, and male-male uh, homosexual contact is less than 1%. So you can see that in the United States, this is more of a problem uh, among the um, males who sleep with men, uh, whereas on a global scale, this is a problem uh, of heterosexuals and homosexuals alike. Okay, so let's get down some basics of HIV and its transmission. So as we mentioned, it's spread parenterally through blood and body fluids. Via infected body fluids uh, can also be spread vertically from mother to fetus, but this is very rare today. And the reason is because we have drugs that we give the mother while she's pregnant, and then we have drugs that we give the baby after he or she is born that dramatically reduce the risk of transmission from mother to baby. The HIV virus itself targets CD4 T cells, uh, which are the helper cells, and these are particularly responsible for defending the body against atypical bacteria, like mycoplasma, mycobacteria, uh, against fungi and parasites. It's worth noting that HIV is a retrovirus. So the HIV genome is RNA, and it comes with an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So that RNA is transcribed, so to speak, into DNA, uh, which would normally be the other way around. DNA gets transcribed into RNA, but this is a reverse transcriptase. So it gets transcribed into DNA, and then that DNA is then uh, encoded into the host genome so that the, the CD4 T cell will make new HIV viruses as it's programmed to do by the virus. Now, from onset to symptoms, the natural progression is about 7 to 10 years. And this isn't including what's known as the acute HIV uh, infection, but uh, this is, uh, we're talking about 7 to 10 years until opportunistic infections begin to develop. A patient's proximate prognosis is going to be based on their CD4 count. 
Uh, however, their infectivity is based on their viral load. So there's always going to be two numbers in any HIV patient, their CD4 count. That's going to correspond to how their immune system uh, is doing, how their immune system can fight against possible uh, pathogens. A viral load shows how effective this patient is. It's like an RNA, uh, a viral RNA count for hepatitis C. So this viral load count shows how probable this patient would be to infect somebody else. So let's talk about some of the HIV AIDS opportunistic infections. So thrush TB activation and Kaposi sarcoma are things that can come up in, uh, in really any patient, but there's an increased risk in uh, patients with HIV and AIDS that their when their CD4 count drops below 500. We're not going to talk about any of these in specific. Uh, we'll talk about these in other sections. Kaposi sarcoma is something though that is uh, somewhat particular for HIV and AIDS, but we will address this uh, when uh, I will devote a section to viral infections. So when the CD4 count drops the uh, less than 200 cells per microliter, the risk for pneumocystis gyrovecchi pneumonia uh, has increased to a point where it can happen and where we would indeed use prophylaxis. We'll talk about prophylaxis later. Below 100 per microliter, the risk increases for toxoplasmosis and for cryptococcal meningitis. And then below 50 per microliter, the risk increases for the mycobacterium avium complex or MAC and the CMV diseases. So really we would consider any patient that has a CD4 cell count less than 200 to be uh, in the state of AIDS rather than just HIV infection. But any patient that develops one of these syndromes no matter what their CD4 count is we would consider them to have AIDS rather than just simply HIV infection. Okay, so we'll start by talking about pneumocystis gyrovecchi pneumonia. This uh, used to be called pneumocystis carini, uh, which is how it gets its abbreviation PCP. That's where that C comes from. Now, the reason it has two names is because once upon a time we thought this was a protozoa. And if you look at the, the uh, microbe underneath a microscope, you would see that uh, this indeed does have some resemblance to a protozoa in that it's uh, amoeboid-like in appearance. But really, truly, this is a yeast-like fungus. It's human-specific, and it also cannot be cultured ex vivo. So this uh, gives us a little bit of difficulty in, uh, in detecting this when a patient has it. Symptomatically, it presents like any old pneumonia. So there's going to be cough, uh, may or may not be productive, dyspnea, chest pain, fever, constitutional symptoms. Now, anytime you have this in a patient who is known to have HIV, your immediate first step, once you know that they're stable, is going to be to get a CD4 count. Because if the patient's CD4 count, if they have HIV and their CD4 count is, is good, if it's 700, 800, 900, then you really aren't so worried about an opportunistic disease. That would be pretty rare. So in that case, you would go ahead and treat them like any old pneumonia patient because patients with HIV, just like the rest of us, can get regular old strep pneumonia. On the other hand, if their CD4 count is 150 or 170, then you're concerned about PCP. Or at the very least, you need to consider it in your differential, because if you just go ahead and hit them with antibiotics, like you would for any other pneumonia patient, then you may be missing the PCP. You will miss the PCP, and the patient will deteriorate. So what you want to do, keeping this in your differential, uh, if they do have a low CD4 count, is to get a sputum sample. And the sputum sample is not always uh, is not always good. It's not very sensitive. Uh, however, if you do get a positive sputum sample, then you for sure have a diagnosis. But if you get a negative sputum sample, you still want to do a little bit more investigating. So the sputum sample is good. It's uh, it's very specific, but it's not very sensitive. So 
If you get a negative sputum sample, then you're going to go ahead and get uh, do a bronchoscopy and get bronchoalveolar lavage. And we have a technique that we can use uh, for this. We used to use a methenamine silver stain. Uh, that's kind of gone out of fashion now. We use a calcifor white stain. And this is actually a fluorescent technique where you can do the mixing and then put it under the, the microscope and it turns this fluorescent green color. And so this would be the most accurate test. It's a bronchoalveolar lavage. For treatment, any positive test is going to be, uh, initi you're going to initiate treatment with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. It really depends on how sick they are. So if uh, usually you're going to base that on their clinical appearance as well as their, uh, their partial pressure of oxygen. Uh, so you can do PO or IV treatment, really, like I said, just depends on how sick they are. Um, the mainstay of treatment is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. However, if they're allergic, you can uh, do trimethoprim and Dapsone, or you can do uh, Etovaquam. And then also, I believe you could do clindamycin and primaquin. So Dapsone and trimethoprim typically is what we do for allergic patients, but you can also do uh, clindamycin and primaquin, or you can do etovaquone. If they're IV, then uh, you can do trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole IV. Uh, you can also do uh, Dapsone and uh, trimetrexate. Uh, you'd probably want to add leucovorin to that, uh, or you could do pentamidine. And yes, pentamidine, that's the same thing as what you give for uh, African sleeping sickness uh, with the trypanosoma. So what I would remember for the tests at the very least is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for pneumocystis vecchi pneumonia. That is the best treatment for this disease. Prophylaxis. We do prophylax for this disease. So anytime the patient's CD4 count is below 200, we are going to prophylax them because this is something, this is a fungus that's found in the natural environment. So we will give them trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole as a, uh, as a prophylaxis if their CD4 count is below 200. Of course, there are a lot of patients, myself included, who are sulfoallergic. So if they are allergic, you can use Dapsone or you can use Atobaquone, one or the other. You don't need to combine that with anything else. Okay, toxoplasmosis. So toxoplasmosis is, uh, so toxoplasma gondii is a, a parasitic protozoa, and in HIV patients, it tends to take up refuge in brain mucosa. You may hear about tox toxoplasmosis elsewhere, as in congenital toxoplasmosis, asymptomatic carriers, but this is actually something that infects HIV patients and causes symptoms. So what this causes is something similar to brain abscesses. And I talked about this in the uh, section where we talked about brain abscesses because the symptoms for toxoplasmosis infection is the exact same as what you would present with a brain abscess. So you'd have fever, headache, confusions, and most importantly, focal deficits, which demonstrate that there is focal problems in the brain. And this can be manifested as weaknesses, as nerve palsies, as paralysis. And so when you have a patient who has uh, 100 or fewer CD4 cells, the next best step when you believe they have toxoplasmosis is to get an imaging test, CT or MRI. And that's really going to be where you make your diagnosis. Now, Imaging doesn't tell us what the organism is, but when you have a patient who's got a low CD4 count, they've got HIV, and they've got all the symptoms of toxoplasmosis, and then you see those, you see those uh, enhancing circular lesions that I'll show you in a little bit, you're going to know it's toxoplasmosis, and you're not going to have to do anything else. But the most accurate test is a test for the serology of toxoplasma gondii with a positive imaging test because that's actually, it's most accurate because you're actually testing for uh, the remnants, the, 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 the trails of Toxoplasma gondii. So you're actually looking for the organism rather than looking at it on an imaging test. So hopefully I made that clear. But the first thing you're going to do is to get a CT or an MRI.
Once you've diagnosed them, you're going to administer pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. Now, you use these two drugs in combination. However, again, if the patient has sulfa allergies, what drug are we going to have to replace? We're going to have to replace the one that says sulfa, sulfadiazine. And we can replace this with clindamycin. So if the patient has sulfa allergies, we're going to give them pyrimethamine and clindamycin. But otherwise, it's pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. As far as prophylaxis, we should be prophylacting the patient anytime their CD4 count drops below 100. So we're going to use either trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole if they're not allergic to sulfa drugs. Now, what's interesting here is that, going back to pneumocystis girovecchi, if their CD4 count drops below 200, we're already using trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So you don't really even have to worry about prophylacting those patients for toxoplasmosis because they're already on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. However, patients that are getting uh, Dapsone, you're going to have to add a tovaclone to their regimen. Okay? So if they're only on one, if they're only on a tovaclone, then you have to add the Dapsone. If they're only on that Dapsone, you have to add the tovaclone once they drop below 100. And so here's a CT and an MRI in the middle here uh, that shows uh, toxoplasmosis. So here's your ring-enhancing lesions. Here's one here, another one here, and another one here. Here's a really big one here. And then here's like at least four of them. Pretty, pretty clear. Okay, cryptococcal meningitis. So this is caused by another fungus, Cryptococcus neoformans, and this uh, can infect people that are immunocompetent, but it's very rare. But in HIV patients, uh, it is relatively common when the CD4 count is below 100. Now, the way to think about this is not cryptococcosis, like you might see it in some textbooks, but cryptococcal meningitis, because this is going to present like a meningitis. And so these patients, yes, they'll have HIV and AIDS, yes, they'll have a low CD4 count, but they'll present with meningitis. Fever, headache, meningismus, positive Kernig and Brzezinski signs, malaise, and so forth. And so, yes, you should be getting an LP and a CSF analysis because maybe they do have uh, pneumococcal meningitis, or maybe they do have uh, meningococcal meningitis, but there's a strong possibility it could be cryptococcal meningitis, so we have to do that India ink test. And the India ink test will uh, stain the cryptococcus and will give us a diagnosis. So the best first diagnostic step is a lumbar puncture for CSF analysis and an India ink test. And remember, any patient where we suspect meningitis, if they have symptoms that show possibly an increased intracranial pressure, then we do need to get imaging before we go forth with that lumbar puncture. Uh, the serology for cryptococcal antigen can be useful too, but the best first diagnostic step is going to be the lumbar puncture for CSF analysis and India ink test. The treatment for cryptococcal meningitis is going to be amphotericin B, and that's going to be given IV for 10 to 14 days. I should preface that all of these patients with opportunistic infections are going to be admitted to the hospital. After those 10 to 14 days, uh, with significant improvement, we can discharge them home on oral fluconazole, and they're going to be taking that forever. So once you've gotten cryptococcal meningitis, uh, and you're home from the hospital, you're on oral fluconazole forever. And there's no prophylaxis for cryptococcal meningitis, but patients who have developed cryptococcal meningitis, they're going to be on the oral fluconazole forever. So you can kind of think of that as a prophylaxis in a way. Okay, so now we're down to the diseases that come up when the CD4 count drops below 50. So Mycobacterium avium complex, this is also known as Mycobacterium avium intracellulare infection, and this is a, uh, due to uh, a mycobacterium, and the infection is related to tuberculosis in that it's primarily in the lungs, but it can become disseminated 
to other tissue and result in systemic manifestations. And that's when we really, really have the problems with these patients. So productive cough can be a sign of mycobacterium avium complex if the patient's CD4 count is low enough. But generally the way they'll present is with these other systemic manifestations such as fatigue, night sweats, uh, fever, diarrhea, wasting, and pallor. So they really look like they're dying, frankly. Uh, any patient who has a CD4 count that's in the double digits, you should be getting a blood culture for MAC, no matter what, if they're presenting with these symptoms. And that's going to be your first diagnostic step. Meanwhile, you should be looking at your CBC to look for anemia. The treatment for mycobacterium avium complex, uh, you have to use your clinical judgment here because the blood culture will take a while to come back, but if the patient's CD4 count is low enough, you're going to treat them presumptively for MAC, Then you're going to give them clarithromycin and ethambutol. And you can add rifabutin, but clarithromycin and ethambutol for sure. And the prophylaxis is going to be any time the patient's CD4 count goes below 100 and we'll use azithromycin. Alright, so finally the cytomegalovirus infections, and this can affect many different sites. There's CMV retinitis, CMV encephalitis, CMV esophagitis, and CMV colitis. Obviously you don't have to have all four, you can have one or the other, and the symptoms are going to vary, the presentation is going to vary based on which one it is. CMV, again, something that infects normal people, normal immunocompetent people, um, but usually we don't have symptoms. However, uh, this again is another one of these opportunistic infections that can get transmitted down to baby and you can get a congenital infection. And what you can draw from that is that the baby, when he or she's developing in the womb, doesn't have an immune system yet. And so some of these infections, if the mother has them, even if it's asymptomatic, it's, it might cause problems with the baby. So symptoms for CMV retinitis would be a change in vision. So any HIV patient who has a ch change in vision should be worked up for CMV retinitis. And in fact, when you have an HIV patient who's newly diagnosed, they're going to get an ophthalmic exam just for baseline. But any HIV patient who has a change in vision, CMV retinitis should be at the forefront of your mind. As far as CMV encephalitis, that's going to be similar to any encephalitis. So remember, uh, encephalitis is a fever, headache, and confusion. And you may see an altered mental status or cranial nerve palsies, but what you won't see are focal deficits. That's more a sign of an abscess or toxoplasmosis. For esophagitis, of course, you've got uh, what you're going to find are ulcers in your esophagus. So what's that going to cause? Oh, dinophagia. Some of these patients will complain of chest pain too. And probably chest pain because when they swallow, it's causing a dinophagia. And then CMV colitis can cause uh, bloody stools, diarrhea, uh, but they tend to be bloody because there's ulcers in the rectum. It can cause abdominal pain, distension, fever, and so forth. So for diagnosis, for retinitis, you're going to do fundoscopy, and what you'll see is yellow-white granular areas as well as hemorrhages, and I'll show you a picture of that. For encephalitis, you're going to, the best first step diagnostically is going to be a lumbar puncture with CSF analysis. And for esophagitis, it's going to be an EGD with biopsy. And for colitis, it's going to be a colonoscopy with biopsy. Look at CMV esophagitis and CMV colitis as pretty much the same process going on. It's just affecting different tissue. The treatment, regardless of what your CMV infection is, is going to be valgancyclovir. And valgancyclovir is noted for its effect effectiveness against CMV. Prophylaxis is any time the patient's CD4 count drops below 100. So we have a couple drugs we give when the CD4 count drops below 200, and a couple drugs we give when the CD4 count drops below 100.
So here's CMV retinitis. This is a normal fundoscopic exam. Here you can see the optic disc and you can see the arteries coming out. Now here you've got your whitish, they more look white here, but your white green lesion, the optic disc is obscured and you can see small uh, petechial looking hemorrhages uh, in the, the field. Here's another one, the optic disc here is to the left but you can see more uh, lesion here, whitish greenish plaques and it looks like this is a, uh, a, a large hemorrhage here. And then here you've got a lot of hemorrhages and then these plaques are here. So three different findings of CMV retinitis. So this patient's going to be going on Valgan Cyclovir. So let's sum up how we prophylact the HIV AIDS patient. So assuming they are not allergic to sulfa, and I, I'm guessing that on the USMLE, if they give you a question like this, they're going to give you a patient that's not allergic to sulfa. But it doesn't... It doesn't mean you shouldn't know what you give the patient if they are allergic to sulfa. So let's cover both. The one that you need to know is the ones that aren't allergic to sulfa. So I color-coded them here. PCP, toxoplasmosis, cryptococcal meningitis, MAC, and CMV infection. So you know what drug is given for which. So if the CD4 count drops below 200, you're giving the patient trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for prevention of PCP. Once it drops below 100, you're going to continue the TMPSMX, so continue the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and that's good both against preventing PCP and toxoplasmosis. The dosing might change, I'm not sure, but don't worry about it for the USMLE. Uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is a, a good prophylaxis for both PCP and toxoplasmosis. You're also going to be giving them azithromycin to prevent against uh, mycobacterium avium complex, and you can give them valgan ciclovir uh, to prevent CMV infection. So once it drops below 100, you're adding a couple more on. And then, of course, you're giving them fluconazole for life if they ever come down with cryptococcal meningitis. Now, if they're allergic to sulfa drugs, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to start them out on dapsone. If, once it drops below 200, we start them on Dapzone. That prevents against PCP. Once it drops below 100, we have to add pyrimethamine to cover toxoplasmosis. We're also going to give them azithromycin and valgancyclovir for mycobacterium avium and for cytomegalovirus infection, respectively. And then, of course, as usual, fluconazole if they ever come down with cryptococcal meningitis. And that is the end.